and boom how are we doing doing good man how you doing oh it's been like what two episodes how you doing steve back yeah. back as always love it can't get enough of it so you you had a story that um we, we didn't really talk about last time um on, on the podcast but i think we can make a whole episode out of it today what do you reckon i think so this was actually the first story that i started telling uh back in the day and uh, so it kind of predates the uh, the Salvia story by a bit and kind of leads into the Salvia story in a bit. Because hmm. we've heard whispers of the story, you know, throughout our last episode and the original episode. And yeah. um, I guess today's the whole shebang. Hmm. So you were involved in, a, or you were put in the witness prote protection for something that went on a couple of years back. So yeah, tell it as Back happens. in the 90s, in the 90s, I owned a decent small janitorial company in Orlando Florida and I started it up by myself and you know it uh, it grew and grew and grew and I was overwhelmed and I needed to have uh, some sort of help so I had thought to myself that I needed to have find a partner or sell the company or something I wasn't completely sure which so I just uh had that in the back of my mind. And while I was pondering that, this guy approached me out of nowhere, just came up to me on the street one day while I was supervising some guys pressure washing a sidewalk. And he said, you know, my name's John. I just got out of the Navy. I washed out of the SEAL program and I, uh, I wanted to, uh, I'm getting out of the Navy with a medical discharge. And, and so I, I wanted to get into the janitorial business. So I figured what better way to get into the janitorial business than to buy a, a half of somebody's janitorial business and would you be willing to sell me half your janitorial business and got to know him over the course of a couple of weeks and talked to my wife about it and decided that would be just the thing you know so we sold him half of the janitorial business and um just uh it seemed from the outset it seemed like just the thing but in reality it's sort of uh ruined our lives you know over the over the course of the six months that i knew him he slowly started telling me every time we'd be alone together he would he would tell me little things like um, how his mother-in-law was murdered and how somebody stabbed her to death in her parking garage and then i would just be like oh that's that's terrible and he would and he would kind of laugh and say well you know she was kind of a bitch and she had it coming and that was just kind of crass i was just like but I was a straight-laced Mormon kid. I was in my early 20s. I didn't know what the fuck to think. I was kind of in awe of this guy because he was telling me all these details about his military history. And so I just tried not to, to seem stupid and just kind of just let that shit. I didn't know how to react, so I just didn't react. Mm -hmm. And then me not giving him a reaction, I guess, just kind of drove him to give me more and more details. So slowly... He would just bring it up every time that he that we had a spare moment. He'd tell me some detail about how his mother-in-law was killed. And then he started inferring that he had killed his mother-in-law, kind of as a joke at first. And I didn't know how to react to that either. So I just would just kind of laugh, kind of half-heartedly, and just uh, change the subject. And that seemed to uh, piss him off. And he, would, he got to the point where he would bring it up almost daily about some detail about how his mother-in-law killed. So... At that point, I realized, well, if he really had killed his mother-in-law, he probably would not be confessing it to somebody who he'd known for six months. So I thought, he must be fucking with me in some way and trying to impress me or trying to scare me away from my half of the business. I wasn't sure what was going on. And this was long before the days when the internet was good enough where you could just Google search and see if there was an unsolved murder someplace that met this very specific set of horrific details about how she was killed. So I just put it on the back burner and then one Thanksgiving, he and I were uh, painting a door together of all things. Our, our, our company had, uh, one of our employees had scratched this door and the only day that it could be repainted was on Thanksgiving because that was the only day that they were closed. And we didn't want to have one of our employees have to come in on Thanksgiving. And we argued back and forth about who was going to have to do it. And then we decided that we'd do it together, just as kind of a team building exercise or something like that. So he and I were alone on Thanksgiving painting this restaurant door. And while we were waiting for the 
for the, uh, the the paint to dry in between coats, he just turned to me after he'd been yammering on and on about his mother-in-law. Finally, he just kind of dropped his paintbrush and looked at me in disgust, and he says, I hope you understand what I'm trying to say here is that I killed my mother-in-law. And I didn't know what to think. So I just kind of laughed like it was a joke. But in the back of my head, I was like, Jesus, there's no way to tap dance around that. He's telling me that he killed his mother-in-law for the, her life insurance money. And uh, I better find out what the fuck is going on with that. So I came home shook from that, from that uh, experience. And this is Thanksgiving. So I just called around in the yellow pages to see if I could find a, a private detective. That's the only thing that I could think of as a private investigator that I could maybe find who is answering his cell phone on the holidays or, or, or what, or whatever I could find called a few places, found one guy that was in his office on Thanksgiving told him an abbreviated version of the story and says, come on down to my office. So I went down to his office, told him the story. And I said, could you see if he, he said, well, I used to be a, a, a detective in New York city before I retired. And I can tell you, he doesn't sound like somebody who actually killed somebody and is trying to get away with it. He doesn't know you very well. You're not his best friend. It would be weird if he were going to confess a murder to you, um, b- given the, the tenuous nature of your relationship. So, What's probably happening is he's trying to scare you away from your place, but I'll make some phone calls and I'll find out. He said, if we find out that this is a murder, we're going to do the right thing, right? And I was like, yeah, absolutely, we're going to do the right thing. So I leave and uh, don't hear back from him for a few days. I have no idea how long this is supposed to take, but a few days later, I get a knock on my door at 11 o'clock at night, and it's a bunch of homicide detectives from the city of Cincinnati and they have driven that they have flown down to uh, Orlando and they want to interview me and find out how come I know all of these unpublished mm-hmm. details about this unsolved murder that happened in Cincinnati a, a few a couple years before. So they take me in, uh, down to the station and we they'd have me tell them the story a dozen times over and over again, record it, they polygraph test me, they voice stress analysis me. And they uh, look into my business partner's background and they look into my background and they're like, okay, you know, we're going to arrest your business partner. The problem that we have here is that there's no physical evidence. There's no, there's, there's no DNA. There's no fingerprints. We can't place him at the scene. Uh, So if you decide not to testify for some reason, or if he kills you, or if he scares you, or if one of his friends scare you, then we just wasted a, a bunch of money from the taxpayers of, of the, the great, the great uh, state of Ohio. So um, we're going to put you away someplace before, you know, before the trial. We think it's just going to be six months. That's how they first got me to sign up for it. They said, we're going to ask for, you know, a, a, a fast track on this because it is a hardship to you and your family. But where could we send you for six months that you'd be nice and safe, that we could just tuck you away someplace? And I said, well, and I had been to Alaska at that point. I'd been up there uh, in the early, in the late 80s working at a radio station in an Eskimo village. And so I knew Alaska, and my ex-wife knew Alaska, too, because I had married her in that Eskimo village. Um, and so we just said, well, send us back to Alaska, not to that same Eskimo village, but send us to, you know, Anchorage, which is not quite as rugged as the, as the Eskimo village. They've got a Costco, for God's sakes. And so they send us to this Eskimo village, to, to this large Eskimo village, which I guess Anchorage is, and uh, just set us up there. You know, they, they help us uh, find an apartment, and they help us set up our, our utilities without our name on them. They set up a bank account in, some, in a corporate name and uh, have a conversation. And, they, and, and I, have a, I have a house at this time that I've, that I've bought in Orlando that I'm paying a mortgage on. And so I was like, well, what's going to happen to my house? And they said, well, we'll We'll, we'll, we'll set that up for you. So we go in, me with the assistant district attorney, and we meet with the, um, the manager of this large, uh, still exists, I don't want to say the name of it, but uh, it's a property management company in, in the States. And he ex- very carefully explains this circumstance and says Mr. Kent was going to go off on in witness protection. He's not going to be able to contact you until the, after, after the, the trial's over. But he needs you to rent out his house in the meantime and make his mortgage payments. Here's his mortgage book. He's not going to be able to be contacted anyway, so 
you know, you're just going to have to take care of things. And the guy was like, t- this guy named Todd was like, yeah, I totally understand. You know, thank you for, uh, for, for trusting us with this. And, and we'll, we're, I'm definitely your man. So we all shake hands, uh, sign a few papers. I go off to Alaska, you know, and I never, I can't say that I never gave two more thoughts about it. I worried about it constantly because it's my house. It's the first house I've ever owned. You know, it's the first house that I ever qualified for on my own. And it, just, it meant a great deal to me. So, you know, I worried about it constantly while we were in Alaska. And six months turns into a year. A year turns into 18 months. I think it's two years later, finally, the trial happens. He is swiftly found guilty of all charges and, and gets incarcerated for life. And uh, as soon as I, as the jury came back, I went to a payphone and called the Century 21 office from the card that I had in my wallet. And I said, can I speak to Todd, please? And they're like, oh, Todd hasn't worked here in years. And I was like, oh, who is Todd's replacement? So they put me in, in touch with a lovely woman. And she explains to me that my house has been repossessed for over a year because I didn't make any mortgage payments. I was like, you're supposed to make the mortgage payments. I gave the book to Todd and I was like, Todd, you know, quit a few weeks later when he got caught doing something he shouldn't have and got mad and threw all of his contents of his desk in the dumpster outside and the mortgage book must have been in there and because nobody ever made a first mortgage payment there was never a paper trail for us to find out how come there there were weren't mortgage payments being made so we just assumed that you had vanished off the face of the earth and eventually uh sun bank came a knocking and they they repossessed the house and sold it on the courthouse steps so that house is no longer yours so I was devastated, you know, I was in, intending to come back to Orlando. They said, well, we've got, on the upside, we've got this year's worth of rent that we collected for you for your house, so we'll send that to you. And then, uh, you know, we considered suing them for a little while and then decided not to, but took that rental money and bought a small piece of property outside of Anchorage and uh, decided that we were just going to build our own house. You know, had never done this before. But just out of desperation, because our, our credit was fucked, you know, and, and um, all we had was a small amount of money. And there's nothing to go back to in Orlando. The business had crashed into the side of the mountain as soon as I left and John got, got, got arrested. So there was no reason not just to stay in Anchorage. So I just bought this piece of property, moved my family out there in a Volkswagen van, and uh, we just lived, camped on this wooded property in the outskirts of it i mean it was just a wild of alaska it just this property backed up to a national forest and there was just every kind of animal that would come walking through the property and it was amazing and it was i told myself it was going to be a great place to raise kids and i'd never built a house before and so i just started in cutting down the trees and then i rented a bulldozer and taught myself how to run a bulldozer and then bulldozed all the stumps out and then rented a backhoe and drove it up the, the, the driveway, and I was getting ready to dig the foundation for the house because we needed to have the, the, the concrete poured before the snow came. And I'd already prepaid for the concrete because you have to do that in Alaska to get your your place in line. And so I rented this backhoe, and so I had to, to build, to dig the foundation and put up forms and get ready for them to come pour the footers. Well, I drove up the driveway put the uh, put the uh, the backhoe in park, put the emergency brake on, and then jumped off the backhoe to greet my kids who'd all run out of the camper van to, to welcome me and broke my ankle as soon as I landed on the, on the ground. So, you know, broken ankle, no money, no ability to, to wait until the ankle uh, heals. So I just had to, I literally duct taped the ankle back together with newspapers and duct tape and just dug the foundation and just, we, that's how we built the house, essentially just stupid, crazy, bullheaded things like that. Just, you know, we built the foundation and then we put the first floor on and then we put the second floor on and we just kind of built this house like you would build a tree house in some ways. There was no blueprints. You didn't have to get permission from the city for anything like that. We just, we just built this fucking thing and made a bunch of mistakes and did things that we probably should not have done. like. For instance, we made the walls, you know, we a, a, a typical wall inside of a residence is, is eight feet tall. 
And they do that for a reason, because it's easy to sheetrock and paint after you're done doing it, but it doesn't look very grand. And I was thinking in my head, well, this is going to be a grand house. So I built, you know, 16 and 22 foot ceilings everywhere, you know, just for, to, to, for the scale of it. And then did not realize that it was going to exponentially make it more difficult to drywall and to do everything for the house. So the building kind of dragged on because I did stupid things. I built a I built a swimming pool in the basement, which you should never do because it causes all kinds of mold issues and things like that. But didn't realize that didn't have anybody to ask, you know. And so just build it the way a bunch of kids would if they found a bag of money in the woods, and just slowly built this this house over the course of fuck I guess it was ten years, but never have never still been back to Alaska. That guy is in prison for the rest of his life. He initially got sent to a medium security prison, but I think he's fucked up a few times because um, some of the guys that were doing research for the documentary um, told me that he had done something bad that they wanted to tell me live on camera that we never got around to and that, that he'd gotten sent to this hellhole of a maximum security prison in Ohio called uh, is it chili coffee? I forget the name of this prison, but it's a, it's a it's a gladiator academy of a, of a prison, the play, kind of place they send the worst of the worst, and that's where he'll likely uh, live out his life. Man, that's one fucking hell of a story. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, okay, so I, if people haven't caught on already, there's a documentary made about us, and what what's the situation with the documentary? So the situation with the documentary is, is they did a bunch of interviews and including my interview and then didn't secure my permission in somewhere, somewhere there was a snafu. They wanted to make it a larger documentary and include more information about my, my life and my stand-up career. But then uh, once, once we all started arguing about who's going to own the stories and how much money everybody was getting paid, things just derailed quickly. So on some advice from a couple of really good comedy friends of mine uh we i just basically told them that that was not acceptable and i wasn't gonna wasn't gonna do it and they we've we've talked a couple times since then but i think that they are determined that they want to own my stories in perpetuity for me it's not the money i would do it i would almost do it for free but uh, for the exposure but i don't want to have somebody else own my stories plus they had in in the contract and this is something that we couldn't shake them from in all the other derivations of the contract. They, they wanted the ability also not just to own these stories, but to have the freedom to be able to change these stories to make a more dramatic uh, film. I was like, fuck that. I mean, because I tell these stories on podcasts and on stage, and I don't want to constantly be uh, contradicted by a documentary. You know, it's, it, you, you don't need to use my stories as the building blocks for a more exciting story. Yeah. It's a pretty exciting yeah. story as it sits. I remember when we had um, John Rinky on from Tiger King, like he worked with Joe Exotic on that. He said that a lot of it was changed and, and nearly, didn't he say like a building of like footage was like destroyed or something, Jared? Yeah, like, and they didn't include it. There, there, there was a lot of stuff like that. He said like they knew things that were relative to the case that would mean he was innocent, but they left that out to build a narrative. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they were telling a story of why Joe Exotic was a bad guy, so yeah. they would they wouldn't include the stuff they knew about him, you know, being innocent, and the stuff came out even shortly after when they were editing. But, but they wouldn't do reshoots. They wouldn't do anything. Yeah. Um, that's and just once what you sign doing, that man. paperwork, yeah, and fuck that. A friend of mine, Ryan Sickler, to his credit, gave me the best advice ever. He says we live in a unique time in history where we don't need those motherfuckers. If if you've got the story. You can just grab your goddamn phone and, and, and record the story and put it up on YouTube, and then that's your story forever. And it's yeah. monetized for you, and if enough people watch it, you'll get paid for it. Don't get, hang up think, get, don't get a hang-up thinking that you need a film company to be able to get your stories out. And that, that piece of information kind of set me free. Yeah. Yeah, you don't need them anymore. And, you know, you know, you could make your own documentary, whatever it's like, well... Yeah, like, if they had the full rights to your story, you wouldn't be able to talk about it today, like... Yeah. I'd have to have an agent sitting right here and, and tapping me on the go, hand. Go into the back of your head. And yeah. Slip up. Slip up. And who want, Make my day. Who wants, who wants that? You yeah. know, or somebody like the Mormon Church could buy the documentary 
and just silence me forever if they didn't like me going out and talking about magic underwear or, you know, the kinds of things <laughs> I talk about with Mormons. You know, for a very inexpensive amount of money, they could just buy the rights to that whole documentary and just shut me down completely forever. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'll, give you on, I'll give it to you on that one, man. The Mormon underwear story is like one of my funniest, one of my favorite bits from our first podcast together. That's so oh funny. God. You like you brought Magic it up out of underwear. nowhere, and I was just like, "Huh?" <laughs> I got yeah. a friend that has never seen his wife's anus, and they've been married for almost thirty years because they're always wearing magic underwear when they have sex. Interesting. Very interesting. Thank you, um, thank, thank you Steve. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> bye, Steve. Yeah. No, you're welcome. <laughs> that, so, that, that's thanks weird. for watching. No, no uh, <laughs> that's pretty. It's pretty weird to be honest. Like. But um, back back to your story, like, so your man did some dodgy stuff, and now he's in like <laughs> basically a gladiator arena, um, yes. and they 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 wanted to tell you on camera, but they obviously didn't. So, when did the production end for this documentary? I'm not sure about that because only a portion of it was my. I mean, they they ostensibly were going to interview all of the cops that were involved with this. The district attorney. They had already talked to the district attorney. They were going to interview John. They were going to. They were going to uh, come to him uh, under the. They they've been approaching him under the guise of the Innocence Project. They were saying they wanted to, to interview him in in connection with the Innocence Project, which is this project in the United States where if there's a murder that happened and there's no physical evidence, then they go through and look at the case again and see maybe is there a chance that there was some 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 technicality that they can get this person off with, but. Yeah. So uh, I don't know if they ever interviewed John. They wanted me to eventually have a conversation with John, uh, but they I have no idea how far any of that went. Would you have been willing to speak to him? Fuck yes. I plan on speaking to him. If, if, if they don't do this, then I'm definitely going to write him a letter and see if I can ha have permission to bring a camera in there and talk to him. I think that would be goddamn interesting for the, you know, hit, his life and my life couldn't have been more different and more unexpected over the last 20 something years that we've, that he's been sitting in prison and I've been trying to be a stand up comedian. So it's just, that's, that's an interesting conversation to have. He has to be uh, knowledgeable about the fact that I'm out there talking about this story. Cause I've done a lot of podcasts about it and I think they have the internet inside there, but who knows to what degree. Do you knows. think he'd be willing to talk to you considering like, I mean, you kind of like told on the guy. So like, yeah, he, uh, yeah. I don't know how to phrase that better, but you know what I mean. I mean, he might be willing to do it because he's got nothing to lose. You know, he's never getting out of prison. His last appeal is, here. His his last appeal to get a new trial has been overturned. He might love to tell me to go fuck myself to my face. It's interesting. He might want a little bit of uh, notoriety inside of prison. Or he might actually want to try to take a swing at me or something, you know? So yeah. who, who knows? There's a lot of reasons for him to say yes to an interview. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, would you condition yourself well enough for a swing? I mean, yeah. I presume it's a good idea with the beard having that one. It's yeah. Actually like, you know, I think you'd do pretty well in one of those, like, low. slapping competitions. You ever see those? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've, had some, I've, I've done some slapping competitions. That was very popular in Hawaii. I can't <laughs> tell. You, are you kidding? No. No, I'm not kidding. Okay. How, how'd you get started as a slapping athlete? Go on. Well, you just stand around with a bunch of comedians drunk after an open mic and you decide to take turns slapping each other. Yeah, well, there you go. I hope everyone's taking notes right now. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, I didn't... Every time we talked to you, it was like some, something new. Like, It's crazy. Like, like The f first time to Salvia trip, which is... Dude, even I find it trippy. Like I, I've watched that maybe twice, and I was obviously there for the making of it, just to kind of like memorize it and I like make clips out of it and blah blah blah. It's a really interesting fucking story. Um, Thank you. But, <laughs> but yeah. then, then this one, like, it's it's a bit more serious and, and sad, like, because well, number number one, the fucker killed his mother-in-law, and then yeah. number two, like, this whole Netflix thing that's going on. It, is Netflix trying to make it right? I'm not sure exactly who they were. They were talking about Netflix. They were also talking about Amazon. It was a, it's a production company that was making it to sell to one of these companies. So oh, yeah. Netflix is just kind of the euphemism that everybody uses for a streaming service. But it was some streaming streaming service. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, man. That like we we've had friends say to us that you should just kind of say yeah, go on, go at it, and then hopefully that helps you book agents and book better better gigs. Like, but I guess the story means more to you, which is I I, I admire that, but I know yeah. why. I think I'd, I'd be very quick to sell it, to be honest. I'd, I'd just well, be... you know, the... God, what is... these stories, um, not just these two stories, but a lot of the stories that I tell kind of ruined my life over and over again. And so it would seem uh, disingenuous to myself to sell them for nothing, you know, and to let somebody take advantage of me for them. Kind of the only thing that these stories left me with were the stories themselves. And so if I don't own those stories, I really have nothing to show for the experience. And it would be a short, I mean, it could, trust me, I wanted, I wanted that money, you know, and they, and they, they would, they would have the check when they, when they were trying to get me to sign. And it was a huge temptation, you know, drove me to tears, drove me to, drove me past the point of, of, uh, what I'd be happy to admit as far as how bad it, it hurt me to say no to it, but. In the end, it just, uh, it would all have been for nothing if I did not even have ownership of those stories. Yeah, that, that's just one of those dodgy things. Like, th- they want they want full control of a story, the, the right to change it. Yeah. But then, like, taking away your ability to tell it as well. Because it's your life. Yeah. Like, you should be able to talk about your life. You would like, think. Yeah, you think. But somehow, they, they fucking, they have balls on them, I'll give them that. Um, to fucking be like, eh, well, you can't tell anymore. Yeah. But w- was there like a term on that? Like, was it just like forever? Or was it like for next five years per- or something? In perpetuity. And forever. What, 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 what if you were able to shorten the time or something? We tried. And nothing. They weren't ready to budge. The closest thing we got them to budge was that they would not own it uh, exclusively for perpetuity, but they would always have the right to sell my story in perpetuity, which means that, say, somebody wanted, this is bizarre, but if somebody wanted to make a Broadway musical of my life story and they negotiated with me and I wanted too much money, they could just go to these motherfuckers and negotiate to option the rights to their to their, to their their television show rather than for, for my life story. It would, be, it would have amounted to the same. Out of interest. Um, who would you want to play yourself in a Broadway musical? Well, Kurt Cameron, probably. <laughs> I'm actually not familiar who that is. You're lucky. You're lucky <laughs> that that never made it across the pond. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, I don't know, man. That's, that's so dodgy. Like, I don't even know what to say to that. That's just fuckers, you know, trying to get into your pockets, trying to get into your mind can take what they can head on boys and there are there are further things that they need to people need to look into this guy further because his mother-in-law was not the only person that this guy killed so he had a business partner before me that it came out during the trial that he had a janitorial business with that he had not told me about and he and this guy would find somebody that looked like him kill him take his take his driver's license go to this to a to a town a little town just across the border in georgia start a checking account put three thousand dollars in the checking account get the box of checks in in it to a to a uh, post office box and then as soon as those checks would come in the mail they would go back to this little town and write every check in that book over you know in this town rent bulldozers buy pickup trucks just everything that they could think of to buy and then take it all back to Florida and and sell it, and then it would just and then just throw this guy's uh, life away a- after having killed him. And they did this over and over and over again. <laughs> and the district attorney in Ohio knew this. I had told them, the police this during the interview, but because they did not, because if you in the states if you commit a, a, a crime like that and you cross state lines, then that becomes jurisdiction of the Federal Bureau of Invest- Investigations. And they did not want to lose jurisdiction of this case, so they they kind of covered up that part of it temporarily, so that they could have this guy for this for this high profile murder trial, which was all over the news. And that prosecutor then became, got elected to lieutenant governor of the state of Ohio, so it worked out very well for him. Well, meanwhile, nobody looked into these other murders, dozens and dozens and dozens of murders 
for people for to to service this uh this kind of hillbilly crime ring that they had going between between Georgia and Florida. So that needs to be looked into. He's got a he's got a business partner that's still still doing this kind of stuff in Florida. And yeah, and, and mean, nobody's nobody I mean, somebody needs to look into this. Yeah, where like where's the justice for the poor fuckers who got killed like yeah. and how, how many like he told me in the 60s. He told me that he Fuck. killed some 60s. somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 something people. Man, that's so yeah. that's fucking why do you think he like came to you to start this business with? What like I know you said and, it was like. Did, do you have any idea why? You just I was. My, I cleaned a bar that was next door to the bar that he cleaned with his old business partner. Now he didn't tell me this, but I guess they had been watching me for a little while, wanted to get their hands on my bar, essentially. But you know, he got convicted of trying to kill this guy. That you know, he he had he had tried to kill this business partner and had wrapped him up in a tarp and was taking him out to the to his property to put him through a wood chipper because he had he had confessed too many things to this business partner so this business partner had the goods on him and so he was uncomfortable you know with this business partner knowing all the details about how he killed his mother-in-law so he tried to kill him well it's like he had no ability to shut his fucking mouth because as soon as he met me he immediately started telling me about how he killed his business partner and for sure if I wouldn't have turned him in for murder, he would have killed me to keep me from the, from telling anybody that he killed his mother-in-law. He just he had a problem running his mouth. So you you basically worked with a serial killer, and who was killing his 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 partners or people who look who looked like him, right? <laughs> yeah, people who would look like him, and, and then what he would the steal their fuck? their driver's license. And his mother-in-law. I wonder did did his wife know anything about this? His wife did know. So the way he killed his mother-in-law is he waited for her to come out and start her car in the morning. And then he uh, killed her by driving a knife down through her esophagus and then running it from side to side so that he cut both her carotid and her jugular vein inside of her. So there was no bleeding. It was just in turn the way the way he says that's the way that they told him to do it in the army. And then she immediately dropped down and was dead. And he didn't want somebody to know that somebody with some training had killed her. So then he just hacked at her, you know, stabbed her in the breasts and all kinds of things. So that he said that it would, so that possibly it would look like a psycho had done it. And then he waited and watched her son come out and find her dead and attempt to give her CPR and, and attempt to blow in her mouth and then all of the blood came out of the hole in her esophagus and covered him and he freaked out and started screaming and and only then did he leave but so all of those store of those details of how that happened were the really the details because those all that was all true they could prove that that had happened so those details are what convicted him to the jury and i asked his wife when she she called me and said hey john just got arrested and I, playing stupid, was like, well, what did they arrest him for? And she says, well, they think that he killed my mother. And I said, well, do you think he killed your mother? And she was quiet for a second. And she says, yeah, he probably did. So she knew, even though she claimed to, she claimed to the contrary uh, on the witness stand. She, she testified for him. But uh, after his last appeal was, was overturned, uh, she divorced him. She may still love him for all I know, but uh, at that point, he's never getting out of prison, so. Honestly, fuck him. Yeah. That's fucking awful. We're probably gonna There's a lot of awful like, goddamn uh, people in this world. Put us like a fucking warning on this fucking episode or some shit, man. I mean... Yeah, not far <laughs> off it, to be honest. That's... <laughs> some viewers may find this disturbing, you know, like, gen genuinely, I'm, like... Yeah. You know, I don't know what um, it is whenever I talk with you, Steve, but I'm always left in shock. And <laughs> you know, seriously though, you, you've got these, and you're right about your stories, man. That they, they, they're yours, and that, you know, fuck. They're worth. They're worth something. I'll tell you yeah. that. Fucking hell, yeah. that's just fucking. That's fucked. What, like, what, what, what can I even say to express how fucking disgusted I am right now? That's just so bad, man. Yeah. Like when he was. When he was in the military, and this came out during his trial, 
when he was in the military, he uh, they were playing war games. They were down in, I believe it was Panama, someplace in Central America where Army Special Forces was training the Panamanian uh, military. And so they go off into the jungle and they have these war games, red team, blue team. Their instructions were, you know, red team, evade capture of blue by the blue team at all costs. So they go out there and they play their war games. Well, he and his men were hiding down in this creek bed, hiding from the red team. And this woman from the village, not knowing that we were playing war games in her in her backyard, came down to the to the river to fill a five gallon bucket full of water. And when she bent down to fill it up, she saw all these army guys hiding out in the mud underneath the the, the, the bank of the of the of the of the creek. And so she started to scream when she saw these military people. And without thinking, he just reached up and dragged her under the water and drowned her to keep her from screaming. Just no thought of it whatsoever. And they were going to court-martial him, but he said, look, you told me at all costs, evade capture at all costs, and we're in the military. So that means kill people if you have to give, keep from giving it. And they were like, look, Man, you shithead, we were playing a game. It's no fucking easy task to drown someone, I imagine. Like what? I think like it might have been for him. You, you, you can hold your, your breath for a fairly long time, lads. So it's not f fucking hell. Like, do, you have, do you not have lads with him who are like, what the fuck are you ass? I, I guess not. Man, that's fucking... So he just fucking killed a civilian woman looking for water in a creek. Uh, it's like, it's yeah. not like he just fucking, you know, clicked his fingers and she was dead. That, man, that's fucking yeah. awful. And they called him Johnny Psycho. The guys in his unit called him Johnny Psycho. So that from then on, they, they gave him a nickname. But nobody, nobody saved that woman. They kicked him out of the army. They didn't court-martial him because technically he was right. They did say it at all costs. And so he re-enlisted in the Navy and decided that he wanted to be a Navy SEAL. So he enlisted in the Navy, went through the, the um, through BUDS, I guess, and then uh, in a, in a um, parachute jumping accident, he came out of a, out of a um, an airplane and hit a tree with his with his chute and it basically dislocated both of his shoulders in such a way that they couldn't really repair it very well. He had two massive scars on his on his shoulders that looked like his arms had been reattached, and then he was not uh, medically able to to continue with his training, and so they just made him an admiral's driver for the rest of the time that he was in the navy. But he got into the military because he wanted to kill people. That's fucking terrifying. Yeah, fuck. Um, I, yeah, um, man. I, I don't know. That's some dark, some dark shit. Like, I'm, I'm still, I'm still picturing the, the fucking. Really happy you, I'm really happy you fucking called him out on it, man. I'm really happy you, you called the PI and yeah. did all the stuff. Like, even you if it meant like, I'd be dead. I'd that's be dead what right I mean, right? You know, and yeah. Do, do you think it was worth it? All the pain and suffering you had to go through, like. No, oh. no, it probably was not worth it. If I had it to do all over again, because it ruined my goddamn life. No, no questions about it. You know, my life before I met him was on one particular track. I was killing it in the janitorial business. You know, I was, I, I, I was, you know, I was a successful citizen, I guess is the best way I can describe it. But then I go into witness protection. I have to live like an animal for two years. After the trial's over, they don't need me anymore, so their help is all gone. Yet, they tell me, oh, by the way, he's filing for an appeal, so he could get out. We might need you to testify again. So I just, then just continue to hide on my own the best I can. I stay off social media for almost... I only recently got on social media because of stand-up stand comedy demanded it, but I lived, I lived like an animal in a hole. For a, a good portion of my of my adult life, all the janitorial businesses that I had since then, I mean, they were a moon cast shadow of the one that I had in Orlando when I could just be as public as I needed to be. It was it, it without question sort of ruined my life. If I had it to do all over again, I don't know that I would be a hero. I might just fucking if I knew he was a murderer, I might just take the fuck off. I might have just gone off on my own and just gotten out of his way. And not 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 paint a target on my back. It was just, 
that was too much. It put my family through a lot, you know, that just happened to build our house like that, yeah. stick by stick in, in the middle of nowhere. That was, that was a lot. And then there was just, there's just a, a million, million hardship stories that come from living that way, from living the rest of your life kind of in the shadow of the mountain, as it were, you know, it just, yeah. fuck it. Like we, we all think we, we'd be the hero in that situation. Like, but when it comes to it, uh, yeah, like how many people would just be like, fuck this I'm out and they did go or they might even say it and, yeah you, know, you might be too That's scared the right to, thing like, to do. but um, yeah. I, I don't know and like in our minds at all we you know you get the knife off a serial killer you'd I don't know you kick it to the man but in reality it's a fucking horrible situation especially with everything you'd built up at that point yeah, yeah. fuck it fuck it yeah man um fuck him. well yeah, I'm yeah. like I'm still I'm still like imagining that poor fucking lad trying to give his mom CPR and then getting covered in fucking blood. Yeah. Or that, that poor woman just you know going out to get fucking water, and then yeah. this psycho fucking drags you into the water. He told me he would practice by killing homeless people by hiding underneath his truck and waiting for a homeless person to come up and 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 try to break into the window of his truck and he would reach out with a straight razor and cut their Achilles tendons and then kill them. So So he also killed homeless people. Yeah. So he you... was killing people any chance he got. Fucking hell man. You're there with a fucking serial killer and you were with him for six months and somehow you didn't get killed in that. Yeah. Yeah. That's. I'm not even sure how I'm gonna fucking name this video. On enough infinite timelines in the quantum universe, I did get killed. You know, it happened every possible way. Yeah. Only in this timeline did I did I not get killed. This could yeah. be the only one where he survived. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe this one's still. Did maybe you, he breaks, um... breaks out of prison and there's a car chase at the end of this one. Who the fuck knows? That's. Do you like? look back and like think i can't believe i was alone with this guy all the time like you said you guys were alone a lot and he was I... like open up a lot do you like look back and think how the fuck up... did he not like slash me there or how did he not like and, and i mean? i used to have a terrible temper and this guy was a terrible business person and i used to chew his ass up one side and down the other i yelled at him till i was purple in the face most nights i'd get right up into his fucking face and scream at him about stupid mistakes that he would make with our business because he was ruining my business, you know, he'd beat up some employee or some shit like that, and I just, I, you know, I was religious at the time and thought Jesus was looking down and protecting me, so I feared no evil, and I just got right up in this fucking dumb face and yelled at him about stuff, and I can't imagine how bad he wanted to kill me or how much, how much he was looking forward to the opportunity to kill me. It just, it was foolhardy all the way around. Yeah, man, that's... <laughs> That's that's fucking freaky. Like I, I sometimes I, I do forget that you used to be a Mormon, as well. Even though yeah, we have a, Mormon whole preacher. conversation. How, how long are you out of it? Just just so I know in future, like that salvia trip was when I got out of it. I I went into like, that gun room as a Mormon preacher, uh, and my family had been it for seven generations, dude, from since the very beginning, and uh, went into that gun room as a as a full blown Mormon, nothing doubting. 45 seconds later, I walked out a full atheist. So, but How many years ago was this, though? 12. 12. 12 years. Yeah. yeah. That's um, rough. Do you, like... I know you said you, you and your wife divorced. Do you know if you're, like, kids? Are they, like, still Mormon? Or do you have any idea about that? Yeah, they're my kids. I would know. Uh, the, I... I don't know. Like, uh, so some people don't get to see their kids after divorce, you know? Oh, yeah. Well, I'm lucky that uh, I got to got to I said hang out with my kids all the time. Uh they all are not Mormon. My daughter still goes sometimes with my grandson and I think she does it just because it pisses me off. So Oh, so she's in still, their hearts they're not yeah. Mormon. Yeah, they she still goes about every Sunday but doesn't believe anymore. But that's a dangerous that's a dangerous thing to do because what if he then starts to believe it or say he grows up in it and marries some nice Mormon who really believes it 
and then suddenly she's the grandma that doesn't get to come to Thanksgiving anymore because she doesn't believe it. She's she's playing with fire on this. She doesn't realize that a cult cults are dangerous things. It's not like religion. Religion is one thing, but a cult is is something else. You know, a cult will try to separate you from your family if you don't believe quite the right way. Yeah, that's just, that's one thing I love about the way Christianity is kind of being pushed at the moment. Like most people have like their own like their own faith, like. If something's going rough you might do a prayer you don't go to mass all the time you don't you know maybe might not, might not practice lent or whatever but most people kind of like at the dark moment they might be like please oh lord let, let yeah. fido be okay you know yeah um but the cold stuff man we're like trying to get you away from your family and shit like that fuck yeah i got shunned by my family at the at the beginning of it you know my my brother's were in some ways scared to talk. They didn't know how to talk to me. You know, they just, uh, it, 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 things changed between us when I wasn't Mormon anymore. And suddenly I was, I was the other. And even now I was the oldest member, you know, I was the, the old vampire of the Cantwell family. And it was, it was to me, anytime there was any kind of a religious gathering to say the invocation or whatever, no more. I just, uh, I'm, I just ha hang out in the back, and I'm lucky to have been invited to watch. So, that's uh, yeah, yeah, man, that's I don't even know what to say to you, to be honest, man. You've had a rough, but I really, I really, I really love you for getting on so much and being just a, like a friendly guy. You know, you'll always have a spot here, Steve. <laughs> I appreciate you. Um, like I, I love when you get on because the fucking crack we have is it's it's, it's unreal. It's, it's hilarious. Mm. I should come over and we should do a live event some sometime. Oh, yes. Yeah, that sounds Absolutely, fun. Absolutely, man. I've I mean, always I've been all over Europe, but I've never been to the British Isles, and and my family's from Ireland, so yeah. it's 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 mad that I have never been there. Look, it's gonna happen eventually. Yeah, and Except I think we are the plan to go stateside soon, especially. Yeah. In, we both are very much interested in like living in Texas. So. Yes. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> we were on this podcast, and they were like, "Because we didn't tell us to talk about this before, but we've never agreed on it." And um, you're like, oh, if, if you could be anywhere in the world besides Ireland, where would you be? Like, if you could move somewhere. And then, like, at the, at the, at the Gove Tree was like, Texas, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not, not, not even just the States, just like the crack that's going on in Texas at the moment. How could you not want to be there? Yeah. I mean, Austin is the new Jerusalem of comedy for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, after, I was never really into comedy until I started talking to comedians. And now I just, just love it. It's my favorite kind of entertainment. I mean, there's just nothing like fun. it. It's so like it's, it's almost like the most personal, I guess, entertainment you can find because it's someone telling you a story. <laughs> Excuse me. Oh yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 a bit of telepathy too. It's it's a whole room full of people become telepathically linked for an hour and a half, and you can you can the, the performer can feel the audience, and the audience can feel the performer, and there's just there's nothing like it. Yeah, but unfortunately, you've you've been away from it for a while, haven't you? A week. I, been, uh, this is the, but you said it's the longest you've been away from comedy. A week. Yeah, that, there's, there's only two times that I have been away this long, and, and one, first one was for COVID, and the second one was was for this uh, lung infection that I've been fighting. But yeah, and it's it's hard. It's a it's a hard addiction to break. You get addicted to, you know, talking to audiences and to them laughing. You know, it's an addictive feeling. It's the best feeling ever bar none so yeah. it's, it's 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 tough to get away from it have you been like using this week off to maybe like come up with more materials are you constantly doing that you're thinking to yourself what would they find funny you know yeah i wake up every morning i usually write between the hours of four and six every morning just because there's nothing else going on and by write, i mean i might write a story i might uh, try to rework something from my journal or i'll i i, I play the ukulele so sometimes i'll write a little song on the ukulele or, or something like that. So something between the hours of four and six every single day. And, and then I usually try to perform every night if I can, some open mic or a bar someplace. Um, have, have you taken a full full time mic or are you doing like, do you have no janitor business at the moment? No, no, no janitor business. Before COVID, I was doing it full time. Uh, and and uh, since COVID, I've, I've just been uh, not doing it full time. That's fair. 
just just catch as catch can as far as shows go and making money any way that I possibly can just to survive the COVID shutdown. But my, this club that I work at a lot is opening up again, the secret group uh, in uh, in June, and there's going to be more shows opening up. So it's just, you know, everything's going to open back up again. So yeah, that's what I'm living for. Yeah, well, that's all we can live for, man. <laughs> yeah. But um, what was I going to say? You speak like just speaking of talking to audiences you want you have every intention of setting up a podcast don't you yeah you know I, i've been uh putting a podcast studio inside of a big sprinter van and remodeling it and my intention is to take comedians camping and cook them dinner over a open fire and then tell them a story around that fire i think telling stories around a bonfire is the way that we always told each other stories. And I think there's something that lends itself to the hypnotic element of storytelling that goes along with watching the flicker of a fire. So yeah. I plan to explore that and to get my stories out and to uh, hopefully put some great content out there. I watched this YouTube channel about a guy in England that uh, does a podcast where he it's called uh, Simon, a bloke in the woods is the name of the podcast channel if you want to check it out but i want to kind of do what he does but with a storytelling comedy element and a lot of these comedians that i know have never been camping and camping has been my whole fucking life so i think it would make for great content as a camping fan myself i can appreciate it because man you could i can imagine like having some kind of comedian on with you and it's like you know you're trying to try not to be like slapping the bugs away from your face and stuff like that yeah yeah or like, oh, we forgot blank. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Something's like it, always happen. And that's that's it. Like it's it's fucking great fun. I do a bit of camping. Uh, Thomas, I don't know you've done a bit of camping, have you? I've done a little bit, but uh, nothing. You know, nothing that's um, crazy. Kind of yeah. just like pin the tent down there and then yeah. drink drink a slab of cans and pass out <laughs> at like four o'clock in the morning and forget to sleep in the tent kind of thing you know there like you <laughs> so yeah. nothing like survivor man um <laughs> uh, well I, I don't think he has much on me but it's like you can't really compare you know um can't yeah compare i feel like you'd be a modest mm. ah, nah. <laughs> yeah. yeah no cat camp is great crack do you have any camping stories for us before we let you go any Bigfoot stories? I got a camp. I got a camping story. So, I used to. Uh, my family used to go camping a lot in Alaska. And in Alaska, uh, you have to have something with you when you camp called a bear dog, and uh, because otherwise a bear will come and sneak up on you. And one of my friends got their baby got eaten by a bear, and so oh my fucking get, bears what the fuck are. Did you serious... ask me for a camping story? What did I... you expect? <laughs> are you are you are you fucking serious go yeah. on go on jesus man. so we were all scared shitless of bears uh and so we for sure made sure that we had a, a bear dog with us anytime that we went outside and we would go camping all the time and we would take this big rv out into the the wilderness and at this time i had recently started smoking uh marijuana and so my wife would make a deal with me she said if you would do all the driving when we get up to the camp spot, you know, the kids and I will set up the camp and do all the work. If And you can just go off into the tr- into the trees and decompress and smoke your your marijuana. So I was like, that's a great deal. And that was the that was what we did. So we had this bear dog. But we this one trip, we also had just gotten a kitten that we called Poo Poo Kitty. And it was a proper pet that the kids could love because they can't really love the bear dog bear dogs. You only have this bear dog for a few months and then it encounters a bear and sometimes you get the collar back and sometimes you don't but you have to just go get a new bear dog at the at the pound so this bear dog was always trying to eat poo poo kitty and so it was just stressful watching that drama unfold in the rear view mirror so we pull up at this camp spot my wife says if you can just start a big old fire you can go off into the trees and the kids and i'll do all the work so i was like no problem started the giant fire i leave <clears throat> and then she makes a crucial error. She 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 knew, she knows she has to keep the bear dog and poo poo kitty away from each other. So she locks the bear dog in the RV and puts poo poo kitty out walking point in the campsite just to to alert us of any bears. And then they all start busily, you know, setting up the camp. And she's carrying an igloo cooler and can't see where she's going. 
and she steps on Poo Poo Kitty and breaks his little Poo Poo Kitty back. It doesn't kill it outright, just, you know, hurts it so bad that you know it's going to die. And so my kids are all crying. I'm not anywhere. We have a shotgun, but we've never fired it in anger. So she racks a shell into the shotgun and tries to get herself to, like, put Poo Poo Kitty out of its misery, but she, it was too violent and too big of a gun and too small of a cat, so she just... She just uh, panics and waits for me to come from the trees and waits and waits and waits and I don't come back. So she waits as long as she can and then she can't take it anymore. So she just bends down and picks up Poo Poo Kitty and throws it into the fire to put it out of out of its misery. And doesn't doesn't die in, instantaneously, you know, crawls its way out of the fire a little bit. And she has to kick it back into the fire. And then I come out of the trees about five minutes later. And everybody is just crying hysterically around around the campfire. The bear dogs in the RV, so I know some some kind of shit has broken out. So, uh, yeah, I think that might be the last time we ever went camping together as a family. Now that I think about it, we got a divorce soon after, and that I can't tell you how many times that poo poo kitty incident was brought up in our custody battle, as like she she couldn't. She could not deal with the fact that it was her fault. Like, she she couldn't forgive me for not being there, and I couldn't bring myself to take responsibility for something that happened when I wasn't even there, you know, so... In fairness, Steve, that's not your fault, like... It's not yeah, my fault. That's, that's fucking stupid. Yeah. Yeah. I like, so she was an Eskimo guy. Yeah, she could have done... Like, this, the shotgun thing was the right thing to do. The fucking... Yeah. You know, putting Poo Poo Kitty back into a fire over and over till it stopped moving yeah. wasn't the right thing to do. She testified in, in court that she thought it would be instantaneous. Like the way things dematerialize in the science fiction movie. Did she ever cook? No. No, she's not a cooker. There you go. Dude, that, that's awful. I said it was traumatizing for your kids. Trauma? Oh, it was years of bedwetting and therapy and then one per- parent-teacher conference after another where... A teacher would slide across the desk some troubling, you know, some construction paper masterpiece of a burning cat written in some, in one of my kids' chubby, heartbroken fists, you know, of just everybody in the family is crying except for daddy who's smiling and looks a little bit stoned, essentially. It was just, and it was just years of therapy, and they, they still, none of them still enjoy camping. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that, like, that's, fuck. <laughs> there, there's your camping story. Yeah, I'm. So, I'm not asking you for any other stories today, um, <laughs> dude. I get. Oh, you have a grocery shopping story. Oh yeah, I witnessed fucking. I don't know. Walmart got nuked on my watch. Like. Yeah, I've had yeah. a number of troubling stories, and I got a number of stories, and none of them are happy. Yeah, and somehow you're a comedian. That's a way to deal with the pain, I guess. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, so I guess before before we finish, we'll get to an hour like with, with comedy I mean I asked you the first time we talked but it's been nearly a year like um, what, what's the overall goal with it now to just keep going make it a full time gig or what, what's the deal uh, yeah just keep going just do a, do what I'm doing now if it never gets any better than this it's still amazing you know just uh, travel around tell my burning cat stories and uh start a podcast and try to get more and more people to come listen to the burning cat stories. Essentially that's the, that's the plan in a nutshell. That's such an awful story. That's killing serious. Me, Steve. You're, you're, you're killing me, man. Uh, that story, a story crushes on stage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm sure they, they fucking love it. Yeah. So thanks for getting on Steve. As always, <laughs> you're, you're a um, hell of a guy. You, you, no, people, finish, finish yeah, out where do they no find times. you, man? <laughs> <laughs> they don't build well, like Steve that. anymore. I'll tell you no, that they, no, no, man. They, I don't think anybody could be able to handle the Steve Cantwell life, man. It sounds no. like one that... I'm not sure even Steve Cantwell can handle the Steve Cantwell life yet. We'll see. We'll, we'll see. see. Uh, we'll it's see only, how it's she only up from here, in fairness to you. I hope so. Yeah. So, do we, so I mean, t- thanks for getting on, as always, man. It's always great crack. We'll have you on again. And hope to God we'll we'll picture all the stories so we get a good one, uh, a fun one, a happy one. When you can tell it like kindergarten. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, we'll try. 
Um, so yeah, if people want to check you out, Steve, where can they find you? Uh, Instagram is probably the best way. Facebook. There you go. I forget what my Instagram handle is. You'll find me. I think Appreciate it's your it. your favorite, Steve. Your favorite, Steve. That sounds right. Yeah, I'm gonna link it in bio. So if anyone wants to check out Steve, and make sure you do go check out Steve. He's a great guy. Absolutely. And um, if you want to Google any of the details about that murder trial, the guy's name is Jonathan Hirsch. The woman that he killed's name is Carolyn Brown. And uh, you should be able to find it from there. Awesome. There you go. Appreciate so if you want to check that out, you know where to find it. If you want to check him out, you know where to find him. It's been a pleasure as always. Thank you for being here. Thanks everyone for watching. Have a good one. Take it handy. Stay away from yourself. And bye-bye.